Hi everyone, my name is Crystal Fernandez and I'm the events production manager at the Center for Asian American Media. I'm so thrilled to have you all here today. We would like to acknowledge our wonderful co-presenters, which are organizations who serve and support diverse communities. For this program, we would like to thank Third Eye South Asian Film. Programs like CAMFest and CAM's other year-round programs are made possible by our community of supporters around the world. Help us bring compelling and diverse Asian American stories to light. Donate or join as a CAM member at CAM's secure website, caamedia.org. For a limited time, new members can save 15% on our friend and supporter memberships using the promo code Celebrate Stories. That's all lowercase and uh, with no spaces. You just watched the short film Michelle and the feature film White Elephant. This feature film White Elephant is eligible for our audience award. To vote, please click the video player, uh, the link above the video player. Uh, thank you, winners will be announced right after the festival. So first up, uh, we have Michelle, which is a short film about a young Asian American girl who channels her inner Michelle Kwan to fight off her bullies. I'm happy to have the director here today to talk about the film. Please welcome Kenya Gillespie. Hi, Hi. thanks so much for having me. Thanks so much for coming. We're uh, we're so happy to be able to to connect with you um, from Austin. Yes, yes, definitely. How are uh, things going in Austin? It's good. It's a very rainy day today, which is unusual for Austin. But um, yeah, it's been really good. Um, so uh, your film centers around uh, childhood bullying that's specifically race related, and both of those are obviously very heavy topics, but uh, your film is really lighthearted and has a really fun feeling to it. Can you tell us a little bit about the process of how the story came to be? Yeah, definitely. I'm, I'm glad you kind of noticed that element of the lightheartedness because I wanted that to be part of this film. Um, like all my films I've done before have been a little bit more serious. I, I wanted to bring that more lighthearted, joyful element. Um, but yeah, so this film, it started as sort of like an exploration of this moment that happened to me when I was younger, um, where I was bullied on the playground. Um, and my reaction in that moment is very different from our lead character and Michelle, her reaction. I sort of, I mean, I got very upset and a little bit violent for a, for a grade school kid um, and pushed my bullies to the ground like she does as well. But um, I felt sort of very embarrassed by what I had done. Um, and it wasn't, it wasn't like this moment that I transformed into something that could be something joyful. Um, and so that's what I was playing with was this idea of like, yeah, I wanted to capture that feeling that I had at that time of being bullied, but create an alternative reality of like, how can this character take that moment and make and transform it into something, a more joyful sort of moment. Uh, and that, that joyful moment, um, really was a lot of fun to see. I want to ask um, the choreography and everything. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the experience of filming that scene? Yeah. I mean, that was honestly one of my most favorite filming experiences that I've had as a director. Um, it was just a moment where, you know, I, along with my DP and our city cam op, were just really working together and collaborating through that choreography. Um, me and my DP sort of went to that location and had like a rough idea of what we we're going to do. But like, for instance, that moment where there's the pan up to the trees and everything, that was something that our steady cam op had just come up with. And I was like, oh, that's such a beautiful, sort of like freeing moment that it just works so well. Um, but a lot of it was just, you know, we had this dance choreographed with our lead actor and I didn't want to disrupt sort of her movement in that and her freedom to explore that space herself. So I, we just sort of let her do that. And I knew we had this moment where she would like run off into the field. Like that was something we knew was gonna happen, but I didn't want to disrupt that too much. So we were kind of following her movement as well. So, but anyways, it was just this beautiful sort of collaboration with all of, all of us on set, so yeah. And that lead actor who plays uh, Mal, she is just so sweet and very talented. How did you find her? 
Yeah, that was such a fun process. We basically, in our casting process, you know, we did a more traditional casting, but we also went to dance studios and just found there's this Chinese dance studio actually in Austin that just has a bunch of um, young girls who dance and do it really, really beautiful job um, of course and she just had this she came in she actually did an audition that was like it was more like contemporary like hip-hop kind of dance but I just loved her spunkiness and it just it just fits so well with like the kind of idea that I had for this character you know so she just kind of killed it in that audition yeah <laughs> nice uh, I do have to say that uh, this film really did resonate with me growing up. Uh, similar to your experience, I I was that shy little girl living in a neighborhood yeah. that really did lack diversity. Um, and there are so many times that I imagine myself in channeling my in inner idol. And um, of course, yeah. The, the difference, I guess, for me is uh, it stayed in my imagination. <laughs> and mm -hmm. uh, I thought it was just really lovely uh, when Mao opens her eyes and you can see the real metamorphosis and the change. And she's like, she's a different person. Yeah. And she's taking on all of our bullies. So right. I really loved that part of it. Thank you so much. Yeah, I really wanted that to, I mean, it was a similar thing for me. It's like, I, I think the thing about film is like, it gives us a chance to both relive those experiences and deal with them, but also transform them into this like fantasy thing that can help us through trauma, right? And so that's something that I definitely wanted to explore. Totally. Um, so sadly, we are running out of time, but mm -hmm. I want to thank you so much for uh, for being here and taking the time to be a part of CanFest 2021. And uh, before we let you go, I want to ask, how can people follow you and your project? For sure, yeah. So I have, you can follow me on Instagram. My Instagram handle is kenya.gillespie. Um, we don't have a film page, but you can follow sort of my film experiences there. I'm also working on a film right now, um, which is linked on that Instagram page. So you can follow the journey for that film that's coming up. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. So next, we're going to be talking about another great film, White Elephant, which tells the story of Pooja, an Indo-Canadian teenager who's trapped between two worlds. As the story unfolds, Pooja traverses through a crisis of cultural identity and discovers self-love. Let's welcome director Andrew Chung, Zareen Bushra, who plays Pooja, and Jesse Naismith, who plays Trevor. Hello. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Hello. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having yeah, us. Thanks so much for having us. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. All the way from Toronto. So, uh, you know, this must have been a long flight. Just kidding, unfortunately. Yeah, so long. <laughs> the longest flight ever. A, a, a year long. Yeah. <laughs> just terrible layovers, too. You know, the weather is bad. So. Yeah, you had to click that button on that browser, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> crawl out of bed. Um, so I know that this film has been showcased in various parts of Canada, um, as it's from Canada, but I believe, it is, is it correct, this is your uh, first US-based screening? It is, yeah. This is our, our international premiere. Yeah, it hasn't been seen outside uh, of Canada. Well, we feel very honored that uh, you allowed us at Canvas to be the first to screen it outside of Canada. We're very excited about that. We're honored that you're, you're having us. Yeah, for sure. Um, so over the years, I have watched many, many coming of age stories. It's uh, even though I came of age many years ago, it's still my favorite type of film. Um, and uh, even though I've seen so many, I really never felt so understood until now. And uh, so Andrew, I want to start with you. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your connection to this story and may what made you want to tell it? Um, yeah, so it, it started as a project for a uh, local art gallery. Um, it was an exhibition that they were having and they were doing a number of art projects there. And the theme was to tackle a, a community or uh, slash culture that was not my own. So I had chosen the South Asian community. Um, and, and mostly because I had a strong kinship with them. I grew up in the neighborhood in Toronto that was predominantly South Asian. Um, and my parents are actually from India. So uh, I have a very like uh, 
you know, I'm, I'm very familiar with, with Indian culture. So I felt like I could portray it authentically because being Chinese Canadian, that's obviously very important to me to portray uh, another community very, uh, as authentically as I can possibly do in that, right? So um, that's how it started. Um, um, but a lot of the experiences in the film of Pooja, um, I lifted from my own high school experiences in the 90s. I also came of age a long time ago, but uh, I, I lift, so I lifted a lot of those experiences from my own high school experience. And that's why the film is set in 96. Um, and, and yeah, it was just my experiences growing up in a majority minority neighborhood where I wasn't actually exposed to a lot of white people. So um, I was kind of in puja shoes, shoes in that respect. And I just wanted to play with the idea of, you know, um, what it is like to be exposed to white people for the first time, having only seen that on TV and film and what that does with your perceptions and how that affects your reality in a lot of ways. But yeah, that, that's, that was the origin of that. Totally, awesome. Um, Zareen and Jesse, can you tell us how, what brought you to this film and what really drew you to it and how did you find it? Um, well, my agent sent me the script. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I found it. Um, but yeah, what I really liked about it was exactly what you said. It was super relatable. Um, when I got the script, it had only been a few years since I'd graduated high school. So um, it was like going back to my teenage years and just recognizing all the things that she was feeling. The first, I say this in every interview that we've done. Um, the first time I read the script, I thought Pooja was so annoying. And it's because, it's because I was the exact same way. Like I just read the script and I was like, oh, I'm just reading about my high school self and I don't want to do that. But then um, the more I read it, the more I liked it. And I just really related to Pooja and it was really cool to be able to go back to that headspace and sort of explore that again. That makes sense because when I watch Pooja, I feel like a little embarrassed for her, and I exactly. and I know that I was there. Yeah, because <laughs> you're like, oh, I can't believe I get to be this person. Like, I just don't want to. <laughs> totally. How about how about you, Jesse? Um. So, like, yeah, I'm in the same boat as Zarin in the sense that it was my agent. I was lucky enough to. I went to the audition, and then I felt good about it. I remember leaving after this audition. Most auditions, I'm like. I try not to think about and just forget about them until like potentially I, I see something back. But I remember like getting in the car afterwards. I was like, I felt really good about this. Like I felt, I felt like I connected with them really well. Um, and then, yeah, I got it. I got sent the script. And the first thing, the first thing was I was born in 2001. So I just barely missed the nineties. Right. But like, I, I have two older sisters. So I grew up with like some, some of that stuff. And I, and this is set back in that time. So I, I knew a little, like I, I, some of the references I got, but it was really cool because the script made me really have to like delve into the time that's that was like like I hear everybody talk about the 80s I don't hear people talk too much about the 90s uh because it, it was so recent so there was all these all these cool things like all, all this cool music and stuff that I didn't get that I didn't listen to uh that I sort of explored when I was doing like character work for this and then also uh opened my eyes to like racial issues like obviously I I learned about racism growing up and stuff but I never really like I never really knew exactly how how it was affecting people and like really seeing like seeing the little acts of things that um how do I put it like like little things that maybe I never really thought were racism in the past but that I see in this movie how how they affect Pooja and how how it, I don't know it made, it opened my eyes to to just how how like complicated the issue of racism really is Totally. Yeah. And you kind of answered one of my questions that I was going to ask is you're all, uh, all the actors are clearly younger on the younger side. And so how uh, did, did folks prepare um, yourselves, but uh, also your, um, uh, everyone else on set kind of prepare to, uh, to act in that time period? Um, so I was actually the oldest one there and they all made me feel super old because like Jesse said, he had no idea what the nineties were. And I was kind of just like, Oh, <laughs> but, um, I, yeah, I just mostly listened to a lot of nineties playlists, looked through a lot of like old photo albums, um, my parents' photo albums and like from when I was two. So <laughs> 
a lot of those. Um, just listening to a lot of the music, I watched a lot of 90s rom-coms. Like I watched Titanic and like Andrew made us all watch Romeo plus Juliet, um, which is one of my favorite movies actually. So I was like, yes, now I can say I'm doing this for work. So <laughs> that was great. I watched a lot of movies, listened to a lot of music, just kind of delved back into that time period to prepare for it. It was actually really fun. Yeah. Yeah. Same, same stuff for me. I mean, I'll be, I'll be straight up. The majority of it was just hearing you guys talk about it and talking about the nineties the whole time. Andrew told me a lot of stories about, about like stuff that would go on then. And so I sort of just, I guess, built like a visualization of, of like my interpretation of what the nineties was based off of all the stuff that you guys were talking about and like music that Andrew had me listen to. And that those movies that we saw also just hanging out on set. It really like, I don't know. I, part of it's just like the actor brain, but I really just like I felt like I got the idea of what the '90s were. Just like having to be dressed up, and I mean, obviously not not the full extent, but uh, just having to be dressed up in costume all the time, and like uh, talking about topics from the '90s, and I don't know. Like the whole filming process was like a movie for me in a sense, because like I I'm, I live in Ottawa, so I, all of a sudden I was in Toronto, hanging out with all these people, and and more more than not, we were in costume talking about things that were in the 90s so i i feel like it kind of just it sort of just happened like like we were we were dealing with it so much and, and talking about the 90s so much i felt like we just sort of fused with it almost um andrew i thought that the 90s throwback and uh, the accompanying soundtrack was so much fun uh, for me to remember. I am a 90s kid. And so to, you know, have all of that come back and uh, it really had a very authentic feel. I remember that there were some posters in the background that I almost missed because they were done so well that were like kind of knockoff movie or ads posters. So I thought that was really great. Can you talk a little bit about the experience of like making uh, it really feel like it was all in the 90s? Yeah, I mean, that, that was probably the most fun part in a lot of ways uh, on the production side, like putting together a lot of the the costumes, the, the outfits and the props, like you said, like the posters that we had, like everybody loved the posters. And that was a fun thing to, to make as well. Um, I was lifting things from the 90s, me and the production designer and the, the costume designer, we worked closely together did a lot of research on the 90s i mean we didn't i me and the costume designer didn't need to do so much research because we lived that time production designer was a bit younger so we had to get her up to speed but <laughs> but uh but for us it wasn't like like a lot of the costumes were actually my wardrobe when i was in really school. so it was still at being you know asian like we still have all that clothes in our closets at her parents house so i found yeah. like a huge stash of like everything i wore in high school so I was like, let's just use all this. So I gave it all to the costume designer and she kind of picked and she chose like what she liked. And so Jesse wears some of my clothes from high school, right? Some of those were my sweaters, right? Um, but yeah, yeah. So, and yeah, actually even Gerline who plays Mapri, like she wears like my brother's shirt from high school. So like we, we kind of used a lot of stuff like that. So it really is like authentic, right? Um, but yeah, so that was, that was really fun. I'm pretty sure I still have my overalls that look a lot like Pooja's. <laughs> it's coming back. Those so are actually my know. overalls. Like those, those are yours, are now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I asked them if they had like stuff that would kind of like with my docs. Them. Yeah, I, I had a ton of wardrobe that was just like my clothes. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and um uh, I want to ask, like, even in BIPOC filmmaking, uh, one of the things that we really don't see very much is the real extent of diasporas. And in your film, I really like how you Im incorporated different um, aspects of the Indian uh, diaspora. Um, you have Manpreet, who uh, does identify more closely with her Indian roots, and Pooja, who doesn't, as well as Jamie. Uh, who was born in Trinidad and identifies more closely with her West Indian roots. And um, here in San Francisco, we really don't have a lot of people who are from, um, uh, who are West Indian. And so your film, I would say, is probably one of the first um, interactions that a lot of people here in the Bay Area will have with, uh, with West Indian culture. Um, so uh, I want to ask you, what made you choose to represent these different di diasporic identities and to incorporate so many? 
I mean, that, that's part of like the fabric of Toronto, right? Like uh, a lot of the neighborhoods, it, this is, it takes place in the suburbs of Toronto, but like the diversity in our city and, and the greater metropolitan area is like so great that, that um, naturally like you see all these culture clashes happen and these identity issues happen. Because I lifted that whole Trinidadian uh, character from my high school experience. Like I would often see like Indian kids, like, you know, with, uh, with, you know, against Trinidadian kids or West Indian kids, and they did not associate with one another, mm -hmm. right? Like they, they were very separate groups and, you know, some of them, obviously not all West Indians have a South Asian heritage, but, but um, some of them did, but they still, you know, identified with their West Indian side and would not, you know, um, associate with the, the, the Indian kids. So I just seeing that dynamic play out, I thought was like, um, really interesting, um, and I thought it, it, it spoke to a lot of the cultural issues that a lot of young kids had at the time. Um, and being my, myself, I was Chinese Canadian growing up in a mostly brown and black neighborhood. I felt like that person fish out of water as well. Like there wasn't a lot of Chinese kids in my high school, so um, it was just a, a, so many cultures that I, I felt like everybody was trying to vie for their own identity. Like this is mine. And, and you know, like, and don't infringe on my identity of what I choose to be, mm -hmm. right? So I just thought that would be an interesting dynamic to play out between those two characters, and that's why it was important to me to include that, just because it, it added a, a different dimension. I felt like to uh, Pooja's uh, cultural identity and how what she felt in, 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 uh, at that time. And I guess you probably also, in addition to that, you probably also thinking about the Indian diaspora and in that your parents uh, were born in India. And so that must uh, add to it as well. Do you have like any cultural traditions at home that uh, emanated from th from their upbringing? Yeah, I mean, like, I mean, that's partly also why, right? Because e even for me as a Chinese Canadian, I am one of those outliers within the, the Chinese Canadian culture in the city, right? Like. I'm Hakka, which is uh, a, a large Hakka community, uh, uh, was born and raised in India. Um, so my parents are from Calcutta. And so a lot of the cultural stuff they brought into my household is they would cook curry all the time, right? That was normal, right? That was part of our upbringing in terms of cuisine. Um, and, you know, they have a lot of Indian slang as well that they just would bring, bring up in, so that I'm aware of. But it's kind of like a combination of like Indian uh, Chinese slang that is unique to Hakas, right? Um, but they also have Indian accents, so I, I just it just it just like felt natural for, to me. But I mean, I think those are the biggest things. I think Indian culture and Chinese culture are very adjacent in terms of our values, so that's also why I felt like um, I could portray it, right? Like we we have the same type of mentality when it comes to family and our roots and, and that sort of thing. Probably. But, Um, so I want to ask about um, the conversation that Pooja has in the car with her father, I thought was really touching. And um, I loved being able to, to see a little bit more uh, of their relationship. Uh, did you consider diving a little bit deeper uh, into that part of her life at all? I did, yeah. I mean, I wish we had more time. I mean, a lot of it is just money and resources, right? I think, you know, when I've been asked, like, you know, what I would have changed about the film, I think it, I obviously would have included more scenes with, with um, Pooja and her family. I wish I could have had some scenes with her at home, with her mother, and with her brother, because she does have a brother, which is never mentioned in the film. Um, but yeah, so there's a lot of things that I wish I could have explored deeper. So, but, but the most we could do is those scenes with her dad um, to kind of, uh, you know, bottle it up into something that uh, makes sense. Totally. I feel like, you know, uh, filmmakers probably always have tons of things that they want to include in their films and it's hard to include everything. Um, I think the relationship between Pooja and Trevor was also a really interesting one. It was not, it didn't go in the direction I thought it was going to go in. And so I really liked that. Um, did it, uh, uh, Zareen and Jesse, did it surprise you when you were reading the script in the direction that that was going to go? Uh, yeah because normally it doesn't go that direction. So I was definitely surprised. I was like, what? There's no bend it like Beckham moment where 
the get together. Um, but it's like, it was interesting because that was definitely more realistic and you don't see that because obviously most um, coming of age movies have like happy endings, especially the 90s ones Like there's always happy endings. So it was surprising to see, but I really liked the way that it ended because it, it seemed like the natural way for it to end. Yeah, plus Andrew said he was saving that for the sequel, right? <laughs> I know, I wish, right? Like, you're saying, you're saying I, you're gonna cast us both again? Yeah, like, yeah. The, the college versions. Of yeah, I thought, <laughs> I thought that was the plan. Yeah. You reconnect <laughs> when you move out of the neighborhood. Right. No, I wanted to send off together so badly. I, I felt so, partly because I just felt like an, I felt like a, a jerk at the end of the movie, <laughs> our, last, our last interaction. So I, I wanted Trevor to have like a redeeming moment, but okay so trevor's coming back in the sequel for his redeeming moment then yeah, I guess so. He's a new man. when you profess your love for puja after all yeah after all that time and you say i have not talked to candace since that day yeah <laughs> i dumped her i dumped her don't worry it's all you now <laughs> Um, so I have, I would love to sit and chat with my fellow Torontonians all day long, um, but unfortunately we're coming to the end of our time together. Before we go, can you tell us um, what is next for each of you? And how can we follow each of you as well as you move forward? Um, I have a couple small tiny roles coming up in Few different shows. I don't really know if I'm allowed to talk about them yet, but they're so tiny that I'm not sure. But um, and I have a commercial that I directed and produced that I'm super excited cool. for. That's going to be coming out in May, and you can follow me on Instagram at Zareen B and um, TikTok at it's Zareen B for stupid videos I make on TikTok and actual work videos that I make on Instagram. <laughs> Um, as for me, I, oh, I'm just making sure I'm not muted. Uh, yeah, my Instagram is at Jesse Naismith. So it's just my name. I also release music, uh, under the name JN, which is my initials, super complicated name. Um, but, and then I have a song dropping on the 21st. So if y'all, if y'all want to check that out, cool. Uh, also I'm going to be representing Toronto, uh, for provincials at the, I believe it's called the Omaha Musical Theater Singing contest something like that i don't know i don't know the full name i'm sorry guys but uh if i did i would have said it but yeah i'm doing that so that'd be cool that'd be cool, Very cool. um yeah so my my social media is all of my social media is this is andrew c um i'm just writing a feature right now just doing a lot of writing uh, i wrote a pilot um and i have a baby so that takes up most of my time now congrats so, Thank you. It's only four months, so it takes up my whole life. But uh, I try to write in between. Um, and uh, how can we follow if our uh, audience would like to see where White Elephant is going from here? You know, if there's going to be a sequel or... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can follow us uh, on Instagram at White Elephant Film. Um, our Facebook is also White Elephant Film. Twitter is White Elephant Film. PH. Um, but yeah, so uh, we're just going to continue pushing through with the film. Hopefully, uh, uh, it's seen in the US a lot more. Um, yeah, we're just going to keep going. Great. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. And thank you for taking the time to, to be here with Cam and um, talk to our uh, San Francisco Bay Area audiences and beyond. Um, so uh, yeah, thanks so much. So much thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you. Take care. Take care. Um, so as a reminder, everyone, White Elephant is eligible for our audience award. I'm sure they would love for you to vote for them. Uh, to vote, please click the link above the player. And uh, thank you again. Please watch more films and enjoy the rest of the festival. Take care.